Okay, so uh, well, again, some familiar faces. Um, some of you have either had me teach uh, to you in the past. Some of you are currently being, teach, uh, being taught by me at the moment. Um, and some of you will probably, uh, probably get a, a lesson from me in the future. Uh, so, uh, while I'm still here at Aarhus University. So, um, um, I actually was very uh, excited about the, uh, the event, but more or less, I'm also quite curious about the, this Medici effect that I think is something that I have experienced personally, but it's also something I think all of us should try and, and actually capitalize on. And of course, I work in the transverse area between innovation and entrepreneurship, so what I'm interested in is um, what it can tell us about uh, innovation, right? So let's see what, what the Medici effect does. But before that, I want to quickly say something about innovation and what makes innovators really different. So in 2009, this article by Dyer and Christensen, uh, they basically analyzed sort of what makes innovators different. And they found, uh, through basically studies of identical twins separated at birth, that creativity comes one-third from genetics, but two-thirds of the innovation skill actually comes through learning. So first, we, uh, you can actually learn a skill, you then need to practice it, you need to experiment with it, challenge yourself, and ultimately gain confidence in the expertise that you have, and therefore become an active creator. Um, and this is something that they started looking at by different things, and they found five special skills. So one of them is, of course, the associating uh, effect, which is also called the Medici effect, because you combine two or more disciplines and you associate knowledge from different fields. You then have the effect of questioning, so you really want to try and question a lot of things uh, around you, where you ask a lot of why questions, why not, and what if. It's almost the curiosity that we had as a child, but we tend to forget as we grow older. Um, and then trying to embrace these constraints. And then, of course, you also have the other three skills of observing very intently, very deeply, trying to uh, act like anthropologists. Anthropologists, they study human behavior. And, uh, and we have seen that sometimes observing things uh, actually in itself, just silently, also uh, informs you quite a bit. And of course, you need to tinker, you need to experiment, like scientists, um, but also as, as entrepreneurs who keep trying out new ideas. And then, uh, once you have done that, you also need to be able to network and reach out to new knowledge, talk to people who are different than you, and learn from them. And I think if you summarize this, this is what makes sort of innovators different. In their study, they found if they looked at the top five innovators, so here, for example, we have some uh, innovators here on, the, um, uh, as you can see from the names. So uh, these are all CEOs or uh, lead innovators from uh, these very big successful companies. Um, and what they found was compared to the average of other 3,000 executives that they studied, these people r scored very high on these skills of both both associating, questioning, observing, experimenting, and networking. So the way, of course, they combine these skills would be different for each individual. And I think if you had Leonardo here, Leonardo would probably score high on each and one of them. So, um, and this, uh, if I now focus on the associating skill, this is actually, uh, it was termed the Medici effect by an, uh, by an author called Franz Johansson, an entrepreneur himself. And, uh, and he wrote this book, and uh, it's, it's actually a very good book. Um, it, it really takes examples from different fields. So for example, like what elephants and epidemics can teach us about innovation. Um, he, he gives us very good examples, like for example, how do termites build uh, their houses, and by doing so in the desert, they can keep a constant temperature, a constant cool temperature of about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And when he studies that, he found out that they are able to do that because they drill holes on the structure at very uh, strategic points. And, he, and then an architect, being inspired by that, said, what if we could do that? And right now, I think in the US, there is a building that exists that does not use any air conditioning, but learning from these is actually able to keep the building at a constant temperature. So, um, these, of course, are very uh, uh, interesting examples, and, and you see a lot of these examples where people are able to combine knowledge from different disciplines. So, innovation comes ultimately from the diversity of perspectives, and when you combine, of course, these uh, people with different cultures and different backgrounds, you will get, uh, of course, groundbreaking ideas. 
However, I wanted to go deeper because the Medici effect that I want to talk about is actually from an ecosystem's perspective. Because what is important is that, uh, that you realize that why did Franz even call this the Medici effect? Where did he get his inspiration from? So to do that, I need to take you down history lane and uh, actually see that he was inspired from what is known as the Medici family or the Medici dynasty that existed from 1434 to 1737. Now what is interesting, and uh, on the right I've also just highlighted the, uh, the region in which the Medici family sort of uh, operated in, in the area of Florence in Italy. And uh, you can see these are sort of the stalwarts of the Medici family. Um, and uh, what they all did uh, or what they were very famous for was, of course, they started for uh, they started business and they started with the wool trade. Starting with wool and moving on to alum, they became very powerful businessmen in the area. However, what they did uh, was also, I think they're uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, they're credited to, for example, the creation of the middle class. The reason is because they were not rulers, because at the time in which they existed, there were two types of people. You had royalty and you had the commoners. And they came in and said, okay, what if we actually um, use trade and have some kind of influence to, uh, to, to things? And with that influence, they started also becoming very large patrons. And what was very interesting, and this is one thing that was common across all the Medicis was that they supported the arts and the uh, sciences and the humanities very broadly with a lot of money. They actually allowed artistic freedom, they allowed the expression of thought, and they allowed people to network and combine in different areas. Um, in fact, many, uh, many scientists or, or artists who were persecuted in different regions of the world actually would come to Florence for the precise reason that they knew that they could be free over there, right? So what does that mean? That tells you that safety in the ecosystem is also important. And, and if you see what happened under the Medici patronage was a lot of artists came by. You might have seen all these famous paintings in different museums um, and all of these, I mean, that's uh, for, on, on, the, on, the, on the big one there is the Sistine Chapel uh, painting by Michelangelo and then you have, of course, the Botticelli painting. You have famous poets and, uh, and, uh, and po even political scientists or, or people who drive politi politicians like Machiavelli and, of course, Leonardo da Vinci himself who really were able to come out and express themselves and become the geniuses that they were meant to be. Um, and I think this tells us that you need talent, but talent can also uh, thrive in an ecosystem even more. I want to take you through an example, which uh, I think tells us a little more about Leonardo da Vinci here. So this is a famous painting called The Last Capigliata. And what is interesting about this painting, it's a painting of a young woman, um, is that it's an incomplete painting. It's a painting that he was not able to finish. The patron at the time um, uh, basically uh, paid Leonardo about 240 scudi and on 200 florins over a 10-month period. Um, and in that 10 months, this is what Leonardo generated. Now you would argue, why would a person pay a person for saying, okay, why are you giving me an incomplete piece of work? Um, there's lots of study that's been done around this art, and I'm not going to go into the details, but what is interesting is that Leonardo was valued for his form, he was valued for what he would deliver, and of course for his visions. And of course he was paid, because artists also need to feed themselves, so we can't just have, you know, um, uh, you, you can't just have this idea that artists can always, should always go hungry, uh, which sometimes happens uh, in, also in today. So, um, and if I actually went around and did some calculations yesterday just to figure out what he was paid at that time. And if you calculate it, so one scooty is about 3.42 grams of gold. Um, and if you convert that into today's rates, this, uh, this combined uh, 200 florins and 240 scooty that he got uh, actually equates to about um, $70,000 in today's currency. 
So he was paid about $75,000, $72,000 um, in, in a 10 month period. So you can imagine his monthly sort of uh, uh, salary, uh, monthly salary, if you could call that, uh, or monthly income, uh, and he, it was tax free because you were not taxed on those days, um, was, uh, was around um, about, uh, uh, what is that, uh, $8,000, $7,000 uh, or 45,000 Danish kroners. So, which is actually a very significant amount of money and a, 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 a one in which the artist can use for multiple purposes. So, um, the artist, of course, goes and explores, finds different materials to play with. And this is what I think Leonardo was excellent with. He was able to combine different materials, different styles, reach out to different areas, and actually use the resources and the networks that he had access to. And I think that is the true um, sort of magic of the Medici effect. So if I were to summarize what are these sort of the essential elements for the Medici effect to happen, I would say you of course need the creative talent. And the creative talent of course needs patrons. In today's world, the patrons can be anything from, for example, a university, which is a patron of creativity in some ways. It can be uh, people who fund research uh, and, and grant agencies, for example. You also need diverse inspiration sources. So you need to be able to be inspired from different disciplines and at the same time uh, use the knowledge from different disciplines uh, by gaining that inspiration. You, of course, need to establish solid networks and ensure that you can access the knowledge that you don't have your access to yourself. And finally, you also need dedication to spend time and become this expert that you need to be in. Because it's, it's all good to say that, yes, we need to be um, uh, uh, an expert and, and spend time learning a new, new thing, but you really need to find the time and the dedication to be able to do this. And if I were to then su summarize all of this in then one word is that what you then need is persistence. But the persistence that you need is not only from the innovator in his art, but also from the patron. And what does the patron persist in? What the patron persists is in the ability to support failed attempts. Because failure is what drives innovation and learning from failure. And if I now come back to Leonardo uh, and one of his most famous works, um, I, I, I call this both uh, Leonardo at 30 to Leonardo at 46. And the reason for this is because Leonardo at 30, uh, which is almost a uh, uh, midlife at that uh, at stage, he was having sort of a midlife crisis. Um, he was asked to uh, actually make a big bronze horse and uh, that was supposed to be his highlight. And as he went to build that, war came. It was a, surprising, uh, a surprise for him. And the bronze that he had thought he would make the horse with had to be used for military purposes. So what did he then give? He then was given instead as a, as a compensation, you could actually make this uh, drawing instead. So he's asked to actually make this painting then. Um, so he was, of course, disappointed to first see, okay, I can't build this big horse, um, which he had spent a lot of years, by the way, more than 10 years to do. He then started to do this painting. But what is interesting is if you look at historical records, it says that this painting sort of existed between 1495 to 1498. Three years is what it took. But in reality, people have found out, or historians who have looked at this have said that actually the work for this already started in 1442. It required multiple attempts, multiple, uh, because he was also trying to solve a very difficult problem in this artwork, and that is the problem of perspectives. How to provide on a 2D surface different perspectives, which is what he solved with, very, with, with using a very uh, ingenious uh, trick here. And one of the things that is actually said that he did was inspired from another field. Uh, and then he put a, a nail in the center of this piece that he wanted to draw, tied a string around it. And to try and get the different perspectives of the different people in the piece, he used that string to guide his hand. So again, this tells us that he was really inspired, but it took a lot of time as well. And time and failure is what led to the creation of this masterpiece. If I zoom back to today, this is again an example that you might all have seen of. It's a person that I am also very much inspired by, Elon Musk. And what he does is basically he spends a lot of time experimenting, having bold visions, but also failing. And it's in those failures that he also ch challenged a lot of status quo questions, such as can we actually bring back rockets to space so that we can reuse them? And by challenging the status quo that rockets are not meant to be disposable, he has created a new field and uh, 
um, to allow for uh, cheaper space travel and maybe the future of mankind in the coming years will be very different. So for those of you uh, who are going to enter space technology and with the, all the exciting space stuff that's happening out there uh, and the renewed interest in space, I think this is also a good time to be in. Um, but I think for me, if I were to really look at this example and see what we can really learn, the true legacy that Leonardo has left us is basically the ability to persist and the ability to fail so that we can learn from our failures and create a better society for the Earth. Thank you. <laughs>